Testing, one, two, three. Five, one, two, three, four, five. Testing, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two. Okay, testing. Testing, one, testing, one, two, testing, 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 one, two, one, two, testing. That means that something that previously didn't exist before that moment now exists and it will exist forever. So, you know, we think God created, you know, he created the world in six days and on the seventh day he rested, okay? God is creating all the time. So God is constantly creating new souls uh, to, pop, to animate people uh, to be his children uh, and that's a beautiful thing and, they, and it's made in his image and the li likeness that we are, it is an immortal soul. The soul of a cat and a dog, he creates those too, but they're mortal souls. When the cat dies or the dog dies, the soul dies. They do not live eternally. But here again, we live on in eternity. And so the soul of uh, a human being is, is an eternal soul. Procreation. Man cooperates with God to populate earth with people who hopefully will populate heaven so that we experience God's love forever. We are created out of love and where our destiny is to live in love if we choose. And so you could say on this first part of our presentation tonight that God designed sex for procreation because in this aspect, in that verse that we just looked at, okay, there you go, all, all procreation has changed uh, because at the moment of conception, God creates a new immortal soul as the life force of the person. And so you could say from that dimension, then when a man and woman come together, go bear fruit, multiply, God was telling them to uh, have babies. Uh, procreation, we call it procreation. Okay, very good. Okay, let's take a look at another uh, part of scripture. The second chapter of God's first book, we're still in Genesis. Here's what God said here, or Moses reveals. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife and the two become one body. Okay. Here God is describing the unitive aspect of marriage, the uniting, the unitive side of marriage. Sexual intercourse is so powerful by God's design that a bonding takes place between the two people who experience that, a physical bond. But it's more than that. It's a mental, emotional, and spiritual bond too. Okay, And this bonding can be so complete that Jesus says in the Gospels, he says they are no longer two, they are one. They are no longer two, but one flesh. And so in this dimension here in Genesis 2, what God is defining is that he's created the marriage and the marriage act for unity. So unity and procreation. And they would be called the two ends of marriage. Okay, so we might have a slide on that, the two ends of marriage. When we say, what is the purpose of marriage? What are the ends of marriage? Well, we would, as the church, we, the church would declare that it's the unity of spouses and it's the procreation of children. You could say it's for babies and bonding, the two Bs, babies and bonding. And they're both important. They're both very important, okay? So if those are the two ends of marriage, here's the kicker. They're inseparable. It's not one or the other. It's like they're inseparable. That's the teaching of the church, that these two ends of marriage are inseparable. Okay? What happens if you separate them? If you separate babies from bonding or bonding from babies? Here's what happens. It's Pandora's box. You're outside the design. Okay, God created this great design. And just like the fire and the flood, now you're outside the walls. Now you're outside and Pandora, you've opened the box and you're going to enter in or have access to all kinds of stuff that is not good, that is not good, okay? You have what's called chaos. Remember in the very beginning in Genesis, there was chaos and then God created order out of chaos, okay? And so this is the result. I'll give you some examples. I believe that the pill, the contraceptive pill, we're going to talk about that tonight, the contraceptive pill came out about 1963 
and within 10 years, any woman that wanted it had access to it. And so since the 60s to now the 2020s, it's about 60 years ago. So for the past 60 years, people have been trying to have sex without babies. We want the, we want the unity, but we don't want the babies, okay? So there's been a lot of people that have engaged themselves in trying to have um, sex without having the babies. So what's the result of that? If that's the mindset, we want to have the fun, but we don't want to have the babies, that has led to the fact that there's a lot of people aborting their babies. If the contraception fails, I didn't want that baby anyway, so we're going to get rid of it. And the sad data is, is that um, the, the number of babies that are aborted in our country every day, 4,000. 4,000 babies died today, 4,000 babies in the United States of America. That's about 1.1 to 1.3 million babies per year. That's, um, that's just a snippet what it is worldwide. It's sickening to know what it is worldwide. Worldwide, I said 4,000 babies a day in America. It's 137,000 babies are aborted in the world every day. That's 34 million versus 6 million. So there's been 60 million abortions in our country since 1973 when the Supreme Court with the Roe versus Wade decision said, yeah, we're gonna make it legal. It's no longer a crime for a woman to kill her baby for any reason during the nine months that she's pregnant. That's okay. So you can't prosecute. And, and women are, are, are turning to that because they don't want babies. They wanted the ba bonding, but they don't want the babies. And so um, that's a lot. 60 million abortions. That's one, uh, let's say 1.1, 1.2 a year for 47 years since 1973 is over 60 million just in our country. What else? Artificial contraception is widely used inside and outside of marriage for people who are not married or people who are married to someone else. Adultery and divorce are at an all-time high and entire cultures are disappearing, never to return. Why is that? Because they're not having babies and they're gonna go away. You know, this, uh, th for the longest time, I didn't understand this, okay? You know, it's like, did you ever think about that? There's two videos out and you may wanna consider taking a peek, okay? This is called the demographic. Demographics is the study of populations, how they come and go, how the cultures come and go, how they rise and go away. You know, there was the Romans and there was the Greeks and there was all the replicating in a great way and so that's what's happened. And so when you consciously decide we're not having babies, you're really affecting the whole culture, okay, okay? It's not like it's a war about cultures, but it is a change of cultures for sure. And so if you see this, it'd be a real good uh, awareness of that whole topic, which is the demographics, okay? So that's happening, and then uh, uh, and another thing, that, that was, in for 60 years, people have been trying to have sex without babies, and for the last 40 years, people have been trying to have babies without sex. Oh, because technology has allowed them to do that, okay? And so let's look at what happened. There's such a thing as artificial insemination, where you take the man's sperm and you put it inside the woman, okay? So she doesn't have to be married. She could say she's married to another woman or whatever, okay? And so you're taking this and it's outside the design of the natural act of sexual intercourse. It's outside the design of a man and a woman. That's what he said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and cling to his wife and the two become one flesh. And so you're kind of forcing your hand with regard to a baby coming about because you're artificially inseminating a woman and that happens, too, with surrogate mothers, you know. A couple can't have a baby, They're, they have fertility problems, and instead of uh, adopting or something, they say, we're going to have a baby. And so uh, they take the sperm from another man, doesn't even have to know the woman, and then uh, they uh, impregnate her, and then she's a surrogate mom, a surrogate mother, and that's happening in, in America and around the world. Um, babies are killed or left frozen, uh, just at a high level, this... Uh, em you know, in vitro fertilization. That means you get a Petri dish with a nutrient solution there, and you take like four or six eggs out of the woman with a microscope, you find the fallopian tubes, and you take the eggs out of the ovary, and you put them in there, and then a man provides sperm, and they mix it up, and the hope is that the sperm will um, um, break through in some of those eggs, and you have embryos, okay? So now you have human beings. The moment the sperm meets the egg, that is a new human being. He animals. They've never been really successful other than a few hours with the human being. But you talk about a mad scientist, you talk about Pandora's box. That was never part of God's design, that a person would scientifically put together uh, DNA 
and then zap it with electricity and that's going to be the beginning of life. And I hope it never works because what they're thinking of, what their the strategy is, and they admit this, if they got it to live and it lived like two weeks, they would kill it by, by taking the stem cells out. They want, science wants the stem cells to put them to use to get cures for other diseases. And can you imagine if was a cure was ever discovered for that kind of a disease, yeah. they would want all kinds of these little guys created, human life created, to steal the stem cells and then the, the embryo would die, but you have stem cells to create a cure. It's, ju it's just really madness. And so, um, you have your little sheet there for uh, law, uh, law and Order, the little scrambled eggs. Let's take a peek at it now, if you would, please. I think the, they're two-sided, I think, some of those, and so you may have to look on the back. I think it's appropriate to go over that now. Everybody find one, did you? Okay, super. I'll just highlight some things. It's really worth a, it's, it's a video worth seeing. So they go into this clinic, and the scientist says, we make babies in petri dishes. That is not God's design. God's got it all figured out, the woman's womb and everything, and that's where the baby should be um, conceived inside a mom and then uh, grown to grow inside, and they make them in petri dishes. And that means IVF, in vitro fertilization, and ET, embryo transfer. They take them out and put them in mom. Okay, um, the fifth line down. Uh, you mean she wants to have the guy's baby after he's dead? So if the embryos are frozen, uh, there was a woman in the movie that a couple that went and they said they wanted to um, have this other woman be the surrogate mother and they're in their 60s and the woman said you're crazy and declined it because it's possible if you took uh, an embryo and you put it in a young lady you could have a baby and that's that's possible you know we want to do uh, the natural response to that too again what does contraception mean i don't know if we put it up here it means against the beginning contra you know contra is against we're against inception is like the inception of a drawing or an idea that's the beginning so a contraception is against the beginning and artificial means not natural that's what that means okay this is a fake syrup or a fake ingredient this is not normal this is not natural okay so those kind of uh, just the verbiage alone kind of says hmm maybe that isn't something i need to be investing myself in okay so natural family planning nfp you'll hear it abbreviated as nfp okay that is the church approved method for responsibly planning the size of your family it allows a couple, a couple to live in accord with their human nature, with the cycle of the man and the woman, okay? And it's um, more than just a birth control technique. It is a marriage building activity. You can't do it without a lot of communication. You have to be both on board to what you're trying to do. You know, the woman takes her temperature every morning, her basal temperature, and she says, sees when it goes up a little bit, that's the moment of ovulation. Then there's other signs that she checks and everything. It's like, there's like four or five different methods, the Marquette method and symptothermal method, and there's different methods a woman can use to track her, her, her body, and then she knows exactly when she is fertile and when she's not fertile. So the truth about this um, birth control is not to be found in my preference or my opinion, okay? It's to be found in the teachings of the church. And so um, the catechism that we refer to, you know, this is the compilation of what our church teaches in the area of faith and morals. How do we best live in accord with God's design and his will? And so it's compiled by the magisterium, okay? It's a big word, and it refers to the teaching authority of the church. Magistra means teacher. The magisterium is when the bishops got together and they put together the wisdom of the church into this book. So. This is the magisterium is the, the basis for this. And so it reminds us of when Jesus said, whoever hears you, hears me, he's talking to his disciples. And we might have that honor. So there we go. That's what Jesus said. Whoever hears you, hears me. And he's speaking to the 72 that he went out, like me, to send out the information about how we need to persist in his plan, which is a perfect plan if we follow it, the perfect plan of God. I want to refer to, I believe, our catechism now, and let's go, if you have it, fine. If not, here's some uh, references to uh, what it is we're going. To. That means, if you want to just write it down for later, CCC is Catechism of the Catholic Church, and it's uh, paragraph number 2366, and the page number in this version of it is 628. So we'll look at page 628. And the church is going to talk about a few things here. Fecundity, the, the, the fruitfulness of life. Fecundity, it's a big word. And it's, uh, I love the fact, I highlighted some of this. The, the church didn't do that. But just to draw your eye to it, it's a gift. 
oh man, when I see these couples come out of uh, mass <laughs> and I see their babies, and it's just like, oh, I'll never have my own baby, but to see these little babies, and you just, oh, and how could you come home from work, you have a bad day, and look at this baby and just not just, just love it. It's just, there's such beauty. And they carry them, you know, and they're like they did us, you know, and uh, it's a gift. I mean, and I tell them, and they're so appreciative of the fact that it's a gift. Yeah, I got this little baby. We always wanted a baby, and it's a healthy baby. It's like, oh, we we're so blessed. So fecundity, or the ability to have fruitfulness in your marriage is a gift. There are men, women in tears that come to me, Father, it's five years and, and I'm not getting pregnant. That's got to be such a weight to a person, to a couple that want to have a baby and then they can't. It's like, ah, oh, they would certainly say it's a gift. It's a gift that they sure want to receive. An end of marriage for conjugal love naturally tends to be fruitful. A child does not come from outside as something added to the mutual love. It springs from within, from the very heart of that mutual giving. It is a fruit and a fulfillment. And so the church, which is on the side of life, teaches, it is necessary that each and every marriage act remain ordered to the procreation of human life. And that means open to human life, okay? And so when a couple come to be married in the Catholic Church, the priest asks them three things. What is your intention? And one of their questions, first of all, have you come here freely, without reservation? You can't enter marriage under pressure. Have you come here open to life? Are you willing to uh, accept the life that God may give you? Yes, I'm willing to do that. And are you willing to be faithful to one another for the rest of your lives? And that's the permanence, uh, that union that is going to make everything work in the family. And so, and this is expounded uh, by the magisterium, the teaching authority. It's based on the inseparable connection established by God between unity and babies. It's not, I just want you, babe, because we can have fun over here, but we're not going to have kids. And once you separate them, you're, you're entering into different ground, okay? Between the unitive and the procreative significance, and both are inherent in the marriage act, okay? The total self-giving of one person to the other, and then uh, we're very united. The two, as Jesus said, the two become one flesh. So that's that paragraph. And now it gets another paragraph, and I think it's the one following, yeah, 2370. So, Again, we're just going to continue on this. Periodic continence, as we talked about, that is methods of birth regulation based on self-observation, testing the temperature and looking for viscous signs and all, and the use of the infertile periods is in conformity with the objective criteria, and it's good, it's moral. These methods, excuse me, respect the bodies of the spouses, they encourage tenderness between them, and favor the education of an authentic freedom. You know, you can still be um, tender and warm with your spouse even if you're not having sexual intercourse. You know, just the way you were when you're dating, the hug and kiss and hold and everything. And so what, that's what it means here, uh, to encourage tenderness because we know we have to abstain during this four or five days if that's what we're trying to do. And, uh, and then uh, we can, it, it really builds up your communication and your tenderness, okay? In contrast, every action which in anticipation of the sexual union, in the accomplishment of the sexual union, or after the sexual union, proposes whether as an end or a means to an end for pregnancy prevention, put it in for three weeks and forget about it and all this and that. And But all of these things have that effect on the body. Uh, that's what they're doing. What they're trying to do is trick the body to thinking the body's pregnant. A woman doesn't ovulate if she's pregnant. So if her estrogen and progesterone are at a certain level, then it won't, she won't ovulate. But here again, um, there's, there's side effects to all of that for the woman. Let's take a peek, uh, one more thing. That other side of that uh, thing called contraception. I want to want to look at that, okay? Just for a moment. So this handout just says contraception at the top, please. Let's take a look at that, if we could. Folks, I put together some things um, just for your review. Uh, we've covered so very much. I want to hit just a few right now, okay? The number one thing. Contraception, the word means any direct, positive frustration of any phase of the process of conception before, during, or after intercourse is wrong. That's what that is. And the third line says it's always taught, and, and that was in every church, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, until the Episcopal Church opened the door in 1930, and now virtually all of the Protestant churches are on board with saying, well, contraception is okay. And I believe the Catholic Church is the only one that's saying no, According to Genesis 1 and 2, and the fact that they're together, that that is not God's design. And so uh, uh, we would ask you to preserve that. Okay. Um, we talked about barrier methods 7, 8, and 9. Okay. There's the three ways the pill acts. Okay. And um, 
Let's take a look at uh, the other side of that. I think it's contraception, why not? Okay. This is another um, CD that I heard by a doctor, Dr. Janet Smith, and she did a great job of high-level overviewing. Our culture thinks that contraception is one of the greatest inventions. The church says, no, it's one of the worst inventions. And there, please don't let that confuse you. But there are some different things that we talked about a few. We're going to talk about just a few more before we close. But it says, from a moral standpoint, column number two, it says illicit, which means it's immoral, which means it's not what we should be doing. For example, contraception, the top line. It says, this deliberately deprives the conjugal act of its openness to procreation and in this way brings about a voluntary dissociation of the ends of marriage, babies and bondings. So the church would say, no, that's not a, a thing we should do. Experimentation on human fetuses, that is so wrong. And so, it, you know, the, these science organizations are experimenting on them. Cloning, okay, where we talked about, you know, zapping uh, uh, a new nucleus in a woman's egg and bringing life, and that's so far uh, against the moral law of the natural act of sexual intercourse. Freezing embryos. That's an offense against the dignity of human life. Um, artificial insemination. Um, homologous artificial insemination. Okay, homologous means the same. There are some people who are, want babies so much and they're not having babies. And so is there a way to take some of the man's sperm and then to put it up into the fallopian tube so that there's the very best chance for the woman to conceive? So. There is, okay? There's a science that would allow you to do that. It's after an act of sexual intercourse, nat natural act of sexual intercourse, where you go to this clinic, I think it's in Colorado, and they would work with you to do the very best they could to make sure that the sperm gets where it's supposed to be in case there's a chance to um, unite with the egg. So that's called homologous, means it's her husband. It's not some man she doesn't know. And so homologous artificial insemination, it says licit, that that would be an acceptable in cases where the technical means does not substitute for the conjugal act, but seems to facilitate the act, okay? So that's about, and then there's a couple ones up on top, uh, prenatal procedures. You know, to look and find out if the baby's healthy, cycle and all that, she's not sexually active, there's no sin, that's not a wrong. But if a person is taking the birth control pill as a way to monitor and manage their um, fertility, then that would be wrong. And put sterilization for the guy to get a vasectomy or for a woman to have her tubes tied, that would be everywhere and always not, not good. That would be sinful. Okay. So, thank you for your question and thank you. Thank you for your attentiveness. Let's close with the glory and I can say if you have questions, I'd love to stay and, and do what we can to answer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. And the Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. Be safe going home. Bye-bye.